Hi, Mystery Recapped here. Today, I am going to explain an American docudrama film called Front of the Class. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. 12-year-old Brad Cohen has Tourette's syndrome. Because of the condition, he makes strange noises, twitches, and yells randomly. All these actions are involuntary, and Brad has no control over them. But in the small town in Missouri, most people are unfamiliar with Brad's unique syndrome. They do not believe him when he claims he cannot stop the tics. Even his father, Norman, thinks his son is making the noise just to trouble his parents. Brad's classmates bully him often, and the teachers are of no help. The tics started when he was six years old, around the time Brad's parents were getting divorced. Ever since, his mother has taken him to several doctors, all of whom who have associated his tics with depression. That is why the real cause has never been diagnosed, and people continue to believe he is just a spoiled brat. Brad's only friend is his younger brother, Jeff. Although they fight and bicker all the time, Brad feels like Jeff is the only person who gets him. Their father, Norman, lives in another city and visits them once in a while. He connects with Jeff, but Brad has always been sort of an embarrassment for him. He often scolds the kids to stop yelling and moving so much. His father's distrust in him makes Brad feel like a failure. Meanwhile, Brad's mother Ellen has always been supportive of her son. She believes him when he says the tics are not something he can control. Ellen is troubled by her friends and relatives, suggesting different absurd methods to discipline her kid. Although she trusts Brad, being a single mother with two kids, one of whom cannot stop yelling, is tiring for her. One day, she takes Brad to a new therapist in town. The man asks him about his parents' divorce and its effect on his life. Brad simply tells him that he doesn't remember much about the incident, and it doesn't bother him at all. The doctor refuses to believe that, and claims that Brad is in denial of the effect, which might be causing the tics. He is yet again misdiagnosed, and told that the tics will go away once he disciplines himself. The only time Norman feels proud of being Brad's father is when Brad plays baseball. In the field, everyone makes noises and moves, which makes Brad feel like it's the only place he fits. However, after every match, Norman brings his sons home immediately to not embarrass himself in front of the other fathers. Sometimes, the constant moving and twitching makes Norman lose his temper. He often lashes out at Brad, unaware that he cannot stop them. Brad usually gets good grades and is excellent at studying. However, trying to concentrate on exams brings out the worst in him. The stress makes his tics frequent and uncontrollable. One day, his science teacher brings him to the principal's office for the hundredth time for the same reason. The principal calls his mother and agrees to give Brad the last chance to stop his mischievous behavior. Ellen insists that her son cannot help it, but the principal, in turn, calls her a bad parent for making excuses for Brad's bad behavior. Having had enough of everyone blaming her son, Ellen takes it upon herself to find out the real cause of his symptoms. She does extensive research on conditions that cause people to yell and twitch. In the end, she comes across Tourette's syndrome. Brad finally has a way to prove that he is not lying or being mischievous. His therapist is also told about the discovery, and he praises Ellen for her great work. However, the joy of finding out the problem vanishes when Ellen realizes that the condition has no cure. Her son will have to learn to live with the noises, the twitches, and the attention that comes with it. Still, the saddest person to find out about Brad's condition is his father, Norman. He is guilt-ridden that he never believed his son, but more than that, he is distressed that the kid might not have a good future. Although the cure is impossible, Ellen is determined to teach her kid to live with Tourette's. One day, she takes him to a support group for people with the same syndrome as him. Meeting them was supposed to make Brad feel better, but it makes him feel quite the opposite. He feels like he's seeing himself from other people's eyes, and he doesn't like the view. Moreover, he finds out that everyone in the room has given up on their lives. The kids are homeschooled, while the adults get work-from-home type jobs. The experience is awful for Brad, but it is also the defining moment in his life. Starting that day, he makes it his mission to not be like the people from the support group. He promises to be his own person and never let the disability hold him back. Even after he changes schools in seventh grade, not much progress is seen in how people treat him. The teachers always send him to the principal and the classmates make fun of him. That is, until the principal finds out about Brad's condition and invites him to the stage during a school program. Brad is asked to explain his syndrome to the audience and explain what they can do to help. After finding out that he actually cannot help but make the noises, people start being more sympathetic towards him. 
His life is never the same again. The principal becomes the one teacher who helps him with his biggest problem, with ease and simplicity. This makes Brad realize that he also wants to be a teacher like him in the future. Time flies by, and Brad soon grows into a handsome young man with a bachelor's diploma in education. He moves to Atlanta and gets an apartment with a roommate, hoping to land a teaching job. The officer at the State Education Board is impressed by his qualification. However, she is skeptical if teaching would be a suitable profession for someone with Tourette's. Not just her, but most people Brad knows think the same about his choice of profession. He understands their concerns to some level, but he knows in his heart that he was born to teach. The very next day, he goes to his first job interview. His tics visibly bother the interviewer, but he is not ashamed or uncomfortable to explain his condition. He also makes sure to assure the man that his tics are an open topic for the students to discuss, and it won't harm their studies in any way. But the interviewer doesn't seem convinced. In the end, he is whitelisted. The same thing happens at the next interview and the one after that. He uses several different methods like talking about his tics for the entire interview or not acknowledging them at all. But none of them land him the job. To take his mind off of things, his roommate sets him up on a blind date. He meets a girl at a bar and is instantly attracted to her. The only problem arises when people around them stare at them because of Brad's tics. By the end of the night, his date is visibly uncomfortable to be seen with him. It turns out that Brad has never landed a second date with any woman. He still hopes that one day, he will find someone who can see him past his tics. Brad's father owns a construction business in Atlanta and is ready to help him with money until he gets a job. But Brad doesn't want to accept favors from Norman. The man still thinks that Brad cannot survive as a teacher and voices that opinion every chance he gets. After 25 failed attempts at job interviews, Brad has a mental breakdown in his car. He feels hopeless and broken. But after talking to his mother over the phone, he realizes that the tics aren't the reason for his failure. He just hasn't found the right school. For the 26th interview, he goes to an elementary school. The principal and vice principal are already well informed about Tourette's syndrome and do not make Brad feel uncomfortable by treating him any differently. The interview goes on for two hours and is the best one he has ever had. By now, Brad has learned to not have high hopes, but still, he cannot help but wish to get the job. To his surprise, the next day, he is called to teach second graders. He is over the moon at the news. Although he only has two days to prepare for the class, he couldn't care less about the time and is excited to finally get to teach. His fellow teachers welcome him and help him set up in the classroom. For the first time in his life, Brad finds people who do not judge him for his tics. At night, he calls his mother, who pressures him into dating a woman. Brad takes her advice and meets a Tinder date named Nancy the next day. The two immediately hit it off, but Brad feels like he'll be ignored after the first date, like he always has. Following the fun date, they separate with a simple goodbye. Later, Brad gets an email from her, praising his taste in music. He gets the hint and invites Nancy on a second date. The next day is his first day as a teacher. Initially, the children laugh at his tics, but then he explains to them what Tourette's syndrome is and what it does to people. Even the second graders seem to be understanding. After finding out Brad cannot control the noises, they ask him several questions, all of which he answers happily. By the end of the day, the kids love him. But the same cannot be said for the parents. When they come to pick their children up, they seem to not like the new teacher. Brad senses this but is confident that they will like him after getting to know him better. Meanwhile, he continues dating Nancy and starts falling in love for the first time. She genuinely doesn't seem to care about his tics and likes him for his personality. In school, Brad bonds with a cheerful little girl named Heather. She is the smartest one in the class, but it is her kindness that catches his attention. When the other kids make fun of Brad, she shuts them down. Some parents request their kids to not be in Brad's class because of his disability. The school allows it, but Brad is asked to keep his head up because the parents are the hardest part of the job. One afternoon, after school, Heather comments that she is about to lose her hair. Her mother confirms that the little girl has cancer and is undergoing chemo. Even still, the chances of her survival are very low. The news saddens Brad to his core. The mother also adds that Heather cannot wait to come to school nowadays. He is the only person keeping her happy during the last few months of her life. The news only makes Brad feel bittersweet. A few weeks later, Brad goes to take a test for the master's degree, but isn't given a private room, as promised. 
He talks to the administration, but they refuse to help him. When he starts to panic, Norman comes to his aid and threatens to sue the administration. They eventually agree to let him take the test in private. The incident is a bonding moment for the father and son. In the following scene, we see Nancy and Brad go to his mother's house for Thanksgiving. Seeing her socialize with her family, Brad cannot help but to get emotional. He pulls Nancy aside and confesses his love for the first time. Eventually, Heather stops coming to school. Her classmates make letters and postcards wishing her good health. But one day, they get the news that they had been dreading to hear. At Heather's funeral, Brad refrains himself from going inside, thinking that he will disrupt the ceremony. But her mother thanks him for being her daughter's sunshine in her darkest days and invites him in. A few months later, Brad's life is running smoothly. He has a loving girlfriend, a good relationship with his father, and a job that he loves. Then, one day, he is called to a school meeting and informed that he is being awarded Sally May's first teacher of the year. On the night of the event, Brad gives a heartfelt speech that everyone loves. The movie ends with a message that we should never let any obstacle stop us from pursuing our dreams. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.